manifested mood. By contrast, in the daytime here, some screening rooms have been bringing some haunting images of the war in Ukraine. A church basement seen in the documentary Mariopolis 2 shows the desperate lives of citizens who've lost their homes through the devastation of war. The film is very slow moving and resembles an anthropological study. It comes from Lithuanian director Mantas Kavets Rabesius, who was killed allegedly by Russian soldiers in April. His fiance smuggled the footage out of Ukraine. It was hurriedly assembled. One of the film's co producers, Nadia Turinsev, believes it's bringing audiences something quite different from news footage from Ukraine. The narrative is the, the days that people uh, spend uh, with the bombing that you hear and you see sometimes and how they live. So maybe we, those who can see this film, they're going to be looking differently at what happens uh, there, but also everyday life, uh, all other things. And we here? Panther, another film from Ukraine at Cannes, a small town drama, doesn't on the surface have anything to do with the war, but its director, Dmitro Sukolitsky Sobchuk, who is making his debut feature with this film, believes his movie does demonstrate the resilience of Ukrainians. Being here for us, it's important to present our movie and show which kind of a people exist in our country with a passion, with a power, with a, you know struggle and why we have so much like a uh, fighting mentality. These films shot in Ukraine or made by Ukrainian filmmakers are definitely attracting interest in Cannes. Victoria Yamashchuk is head of the Ukraine Motion Picture Association. People, of course, they have interest. Some people want to help us and uh, they are buying Ukrainian films because this is actually like a very obvious way to help. Again, unfortunately, but the interest just uh, increased dramatically. The Cannes Film Festival has condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The official Russian film delegation was uninvited and journalists from pro-Kremlin media outlets were not granted accreditation. The Russian film Tchaikovsky's wife was permitted to be shown in competition at the festival has angered the Ukrainian film community in Cannes. Even though it comes from a Russian dissident exile director, Kirill Serebrenikov, who has condemned the war and has sought refuge in Germany. Ukrainian filmmaker Dmitro Sukolitki Sobchuk is annoyed by this film's presence and its director at the festival. I think it should be normal process when the uh, all cultural institutions cancel it. Every presenting of the every Russian citizen, he is when he here, he is the part of the Russian propaganda. Russian director Kirill Serebrenikov takes a bigger view. He sees in the current climate of Ukraine that all cinema is anti-war. All art is a huge statement about how valuable a human's life is, how important human life is, how, how uh, vulnerable human life is, and it's absolutely anti-war statement, because what war does, war destroys everything, and the people who started the war and uh, are responsible for all this Despite President Zelensky's plea in a live video address to the opening night audience at Cannes not to stay silent over Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the reality is that cinema at Cannes isn't likely to have much direct impact on the war. But what at least film here on the French Riviera can do is get people to think about the war and all its complexities. There's been no escape. And that was Tom Brook reporting there from the Cannes Film Festival. You're listening to News Hour.
Wealth, Investment, Minimum Supply, Fidelity Brokerage Services, Member NYSE, and Angie, dedicated to helping homeowners tackle projects from everyday repairs to dream remodels, reviews, upfront pricing for hundreds of projects, and instant booking found at Angie.com or on the Angie app. Get your groove on as Lava presents More Funk Fest, 4 to 11, Saturday, June 4th at Baker's Craft Brewery in Norfolk, featuring funky performances from Talk, Paper Aliens, Ben and Friends, and Delirious George. Love is what you make it. More Funk Fest, benefiting wings over leukemia and lymphoma. Go to whro.org slash events for more information. Top story today on News As the initial shock of what happened at the Rob Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas begins to abate. The anger is starting to build. Dr. Joe Sacran, Director of Emergency Surgery at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, told News Hour more needs to be done to save lives. This lack of inaction to ensure that people have the right to live and to be safe is absolutely unacceptable. I mean, you literally cannot even go to school in America without worrying about whether or not you're going to be shot. So today, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz says Russia must not be allowed to dictate the terms of peace with Ukraine after President Zelensky rebuked some in the West for saying territorial concessions were inevitable. This is James Menendez with News Out Live from the BBC. We were hearing earlier about the problems getting Ukrainian wheat and other basics to markets around the world. That's pushing up food prices. The war is also pushing up prices of energy, oil and gas. And supply issues relating to the pandemic are also making life extremely difficult for millions, billions of people around the world. And that is the case even in a wealthy country like Britain, particularly when it comes to domestic energy bills. Those are soaring out of reach of some. So that in the finance minister or chancellor, Rishi Sunak, has just announced a series of measures to help those struggling to pay. People like John from South End, about an hour from London. He has three children, but the social security system doesn't offer support beyond the second child. It's really, really difficult at the moment because, I mean, I've got three children. We fall under the two children category, so I don't get absolutely any money at all whatsoever for my youngest child. I've got a 16 year old which is in special education, I've got a 10 year old which is in special education. I'm registered disabled as uh, I've got stage two COPD lung disease. The prices of everything is ridiculous, just going up day and day and day and day and day. I did used to have a motorbike, I had to sell my motorbike because because everything's just too expensive and I'd rather put food on the table and food in my children's mouths and keep a roof over their head than have a motorbike. Well, among the measures, a temporary levy on energy companies, uh, often called windfall tax, to help people pay their gas and electricity bills. This is what Mr Sunak told Parliament a little earlier. We have decided that the £200 of support for household energy bills will be doubled to £400 yeah. for everyone. BBC Economics Correspondent. So £400 for households to help them with their energy bills. That's about $500 paid for out of this windfall tax on the oil and gas companies. How exactly is that going to work, that, that tax? Well, I mean, when you say paid for, they're spending the money and they will offset it with whatever they raise from the windfall tax. But actually, they're spending a lot more than they're raising in these measures. It's almost like a, a little mini budget. And it's a lot like what other countries have done in order to offset this massive squeeze on household incomes, on the real incomes, as a result of the energy price rises that we're seeing around the world, partly as a result of what you've been talking about, the war in Ukraine. So the, this package of measures is actually bigger than most people thought it would be. And this Conservative Chancellor, who's talked a lot about fiscal responsibility and concern that if he spends more, it might fuel inflation, has clearly abandoned those concerns here, or at least said they don't matter compared to the overriding concern of all the millions of households who are really struggling and worried that they won't be able to pay those bills. So, 400 pounds.